Thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Archer. I thought you were going to use up all of my tea puns. <laughs> so since you haven't, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be spilling the tea about tea. Uh, and there are going to be three questions that will uh, guide us through this lecture. Uh, one is when and how did the use of tea emerge? We want to understand its history and origins first in China. Um, and then how did it spread to the rest of the world? It becomes a hugely important global commodity uh, that many people drink uh, today. So how does that happen? And how did China lose its monopoly on the production of teas? Because for many centuries, that was the case, that China dominated the production. Um, but this will change in the 19th and 20th centuries. So let's begin first by considering its origins. Uh, the tea plant we can see here is Camellia sinensis, um, and it has been cultivated and consumed in East Asia uh, for over a thousand years before it becomes this global commodity in the 17th century. Uh, the Chinese, as we've been saying, were the first to consume tea as a beverage, and even before that, they were using it as a medicine. And Tea, if we're considering it as a beverage, uh, is really only involving the top couple of leaves, the, the top couple of shoots of the tea plant. So you see this leaf right here, and maybe this leaf right here. That is what you are drinking. That is what you are consuming, right? Um, the other parts of the plant are too tannic. They're too bitter. They really can't be used. Um, so. What else do we know about tea? We know, of course, that's a stimulant. It has caffeine. It gives you a bit of a, a boost in energy. Uh, it also has L-theanine, which is this amino acid that can cause a sense of relaxation, well-being, um, and is also an antioxidant. So this is a very healthful kind of plant that the Chinese discovered. Um, we don't know exactly when it was first uh, produced. Um, and used by the Chinese, uh, but it's probably at least around 2100 years ago, and it was likely first discovered here in western Yunnan and Sichuan provinces in the mountains, and then cultivated from there. Um, and we have evidence from at least 2000 years ago that this plant has been found in tombs of kings uh, and chemical analysis has been done to show this tea plant was spreading throughout China. Um, now, I said that tea at first was used as a medicine. So in its very early days, um, in ancient times, it was kind of cut up, diced up, uh, and mixed with other plants. So for instance, shallots, and dogwood, and ginger, other things, and it was boiled up, and that was used as a medicine, maybe to relieve stomach discomfort or to help with a fever, things like that. Um, but it's not until a little bit later during the Song and Tang dynasties, so that's seventh to 13th centuries, that tea becomes a beverage that people are drinking, that they take the leaves of, they dry it, um, and they grind it into a powder and mix with hot water. Um, that's how it was consumed for a number of centuries in China. So, moving along, um, tea becomes the central part of life in China. Um, essentially, it is a kind of supplementary crop. Um, so people would be growing things like rice uh, to subsist on um, and to feed themselves or millet and would grow those in the best kinds of lands, flat lands where you can produce those kinds of crops. But then in more mountainous areas, they would produce tea, which, which enjoyed those kinds of, um, those kinds of regions and environments. Um, so this was a way that farmers could supplement uh, their living. And so we have tea producing areas, especially emerging kind of here down along uh, the southeast coast in Fujian province, a mountainous area, and also a little bit further inland uh, in, in Jiangxi as well. So this becomes a really important part of the economy. Um, and it also becomes a hugely important part of culture, especially as people start to drink tea in the Song and Tang dynasties, as we said. Um, so 
Tang Dynasty, that's when we really see tea drinking begin to expand beyond that initial medical use. And one thing that you may not know about the Tang Dynasty or may know is that it was this golden era of Chinese culture, including the writing of poems. So of course we have poems written about tea as well. Um, and here we have a poet from the Tang Dynasty, Lu Tong, um, who was well known for his love of tea. Now a lot of other literati educated uh, folks in China, they preferred to write about wine, but um, Lu Tong instead favors tea. And he wrote this famous poem called The Seven Bowls of Tea, which we'll read. Um, the first cup moistens the throat. The second shatters all feelings of solitude. The third cup purifies the digestion. Reopening the 5,000 volumes I've studied and bringing them to mind afresh. The fourth induces perspiration, evaporating all of life's trials and tribulations. With the fifth cup, the body sharpens, crisp. The sixth cup is the first step on the road to enlightenment. And the seventh cup sits steaming. It needn't be drunk as one is lifted to the abode of the immortals. So after uh, a description like that, who wouldn't want to be drinking tea, number one. But number two, you guys should be drinking tea. Because what does it say? You can go back and remember all those books that you studied and read, right? Um, but beyond that, um, something stands out to me as someone who has drank tea a couple of times in, in um, a tea ceremony in China, referred to as uh, Lao Ren Cha or old person tea. Uh, I know, right? That's a really <laughs> kind of mean way to describe it. But um, in this style of tree, tea, maybe you've tried it, uh, you take really nice tea leaves and you steep them several times, right? So you pour boiling water on it once. The first wash you don't even drink, but then you steep the leaves again and you drink that. You drink your cup, you share with your friends. Then you steep it again and you drink that and you steep it again, and you might go through seven or eight cups in that fashion, right? So I think that's what um, our friend Lu Tong is referring to here when he's talking about seven different cups, right? And each of them are a little bit lighter than the last, right? Um, as you go through different steepings, new steepings of the same tea. Um, there are other places where we see writings about tea in Tang Dynasty China. Um, so for instance, there are references to tea in a book called Analects for Women uh, by Song Lu Zhao. And this is a prescriptive text. It's telling women how they should live their lives according to Confucian tenets, right? According to Confucian ideals. Um, and you may know that Confucianism in China played a big role in dictating what kind of uh, role you were supposed to play in society, right? So specifically for women, the roles you were supposed to play uh, can be referred to as the triple burden. So the triple burden starts with when you're a child. So when you're a child, you should obey your, you guys can guess, parents, parents right? When you're a wife, you get married, you obey your husband, husband and maybe the in-laws too. Um, and when you are a widow, when your husband's passed away, who should you obey? This one's maybe a little trickier your son, right? So this is, yeah, I see some eye rolls here. That's perfectly appropriate, I think. Um, but according to this Confucian ideal, there are these kind of gendered expectations in them as well, right? Um, obeying men, obeying your elders. Um, and according to the Confucian ideal, uh, you know, we have these books that told you how you should behave as a woman. What kind of work were you supposed to do? Well, you were supposed to wake up really early in the morning. You were supposed to brew tea for your in-laws and for your husband. Um, you were supposed to get really good at weaving and producing silk. And there are tons of references to tea in this particular book I've been mentioning. Here's one example where we see tea in daily life. So this is under ritual decorum, um, learning proper etiquette. So to be a woman, one must learn the rules of ritual decorum. When you expect a female guest, carefully clean and arrange the furniture and tea implements. Uh, when she arrives, take time to adjust your clothing, and then with light steps and your hands drawn up in your sleeves, walk slowly to the door and with a lowered voice, invite her in. Ask after her health and how her family is doing. 
Be attentive to what she says. After chatting in a leisurely way, serve the tea. When she leaves, send her off in a proper manner. All right, so even, you know, very specific aspects of how you treat your guests, what you do are, are pretty much defined in this book. Um, but obviously this also tells us that tea was a big part of life, right? It was how you welcome people into your home and it had become routine and expected. We also see tea um, in some other kind of fun ways in Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty culture. Um, and, you know, for instance, um, there were games that were played when you had people over that might involve tea, parlor games to entertain your guests. And one game enjoyed by aristocrats was called Dou Cha, and Dou Cha is tea contest. So for this game, you would have a judge, right? One impartial person, neutral, who was designated. And then each participant would prepare a cup of tea, um, a variety that was mysterious, that people didn't know what it was. Um, they would also bring special waters from like the, I don't know, the clearest, purest waters from a spring that they could find. And then everyone had to try these different teas and um, only the person who made it and the judge knew what the tea was. And so to win this game, you had to be the best at guessing and discerning what kind of tea it was. Um, so you're showing off your connoisseurship of this tea. And then uh, at the end, you might get some special prizes from the host uh, who had this party. Um, so here we see tea being a really important part of being an elite person, right? You're developing skills related to it. Um, what I find even more fun is language related to tea in Song Dynasty culture. So here's an example. When you greet someone, what do we usually say? We say, hey, how are you doing, right? In Song Dynasty China, you might instead say, have you drunk tea already, <laughs> right? So, ni hu cha la ma. <laughs> and so that makes some sense. Um, today in China, you can do something similar. You don't ask someone if they've drunk tea, but you can ask them, have you eaten yet? And that's a greeting. Um, another way that we see drinking tea in culture is it's a way that you might refer to the passage of time. So for instance, if you want to say that something happened super quickly, you could say it occurred in less time than it takes to drink a cup of tea, right? Very quickly. So there are linguistic changes, there are social changes uh, that are happening along with the popularization of tea. Um, what I won't get into is what we see in this image here, the different implements, teapots, um, brushes used to stir the tea, all kinds of material culture is changing as well. So how does tea spread? Well, tea spreads um, in a couple of different ways. And as you can see, Buddhism is going to be a big part of that. Um, in East Asia, during this period, um, the medieval period, uh, China had a very strong position and it, uh, it exercised a great deal of influence culturally, uh, particularly in Japan, in Korea, and in northern Vietnam. So those are places today where you can still see evidence of that. Um, and this cultural kind of power uh, and influence came about and it was expressed in a couple of different ways. So for instance, the Chinese writing system spreads across these countries, China, Japan, Korea. Um, we also see the spread of Buddhism. We see the spread of Confucianism, right? This idea that you follow your place in society. Um, we also see the spread of tea drinking along with this, and it's happening with Buddhist monks. <coughs> Why do we think Buddhist monks in China might be interested in tea drinking? What do, especially who, the, the group that will become Zen Buddhists, what do they spend a lot of their time doing each day? Meditating, right? What do you not want to do while you're meditating? Staying quiet, sitting in a position, you don't want to fall asleep, right? So tea helps you stay awake, stay alert, and it becomes this part of monastic life in China. Um, when Zen Buddhism spreads to Korea, when it spreads to Japan in particular, tea drinking goes along with it, right? Um, and so this is something that aristocrats get really interested in as well. Later samurai merchants are all tea drinking. Um, and you know, similar to what we saw maybe with our friend Lu Tong from the Tang Dynasty, we see some really positive language about the benefits of tea, right? 
He's the most wonderful medicine for nourishing one's health. It's the secret of long life. On the hillsides, it grows up as the spirit of the soil. Those who pick it and use it are certain to attain a great age. India and China are both, both value it highly. And in the past, our country too once showed a great liking for tea. Now, as then, it possesses the same rare qualities and we should make wider use of it. So, um, more positive things about tea, right? Uh, so it'll help us study, it'll help us meditate, and now we're learning it'll help us live longer, right? So we should all be drinking tea. Um, one thing that develops out of this liking for tea in Japan as well, that is pretty well known, is the Japanese tea ceremony, right? Uh, so the tea ceremony is this developed ritual over time of preparing tea in a very specific manner, serving tea in a very specific manner, right? Everything's done using um, kind of a prescribed way of um, moving and welcoming people to a room and decorating it. It's a highly ritualized process. And there was a 16th century tea master named Seno Rikyu that um, really codifies all of this. Um, and so we have tea masters in Japan who are experts at preparing and serving this tea. They're also experts in calligraphy. They're experts in related arts as well, flower arranging, um, designing the setup of a room just precisely so you can um, have this really good positive experience and mindful experience of enjoying tea with the person who's serving you. Now, when you think of the tea ceremony, maybe the image you get is something like this, right? This is a woodblock printing from uh, 1897, end of the 19th century. Uh, but if you had shown someone this picture, you know, in the 16th century when tea drinking and the tea ceremony was being codified in Japan, this would have been awful because who was doing the tea ceremony at that period? It was men. Um, so what changes? In the 19th century, there is a period known as the Meiji Restoration, right? And with the Meiji Restoration, Japan is trying to modernize, Japan is industrializing. Um, there are huge shifts happening in society in response to Western incursions. And because of that, um, some of these efforts to modernize and to reform include education. And so the tea ceremony is brought into the classroom and it's taken to female students and, and it's shown as this way to develop etiquette and way to develop um, themselves and, uh, and, and certain skills that they might learn in decorum as well, right? So this is when it becomes associated a little bit more with women as well as men. What about other parts of the world, right? So we've talked about tea spreading to East Asia. How does it spread, for instance, to um, Central Asia or Inner Asia? Um, it's going to spread that way through trade, through overland routes, right? So some, some networks and uh, trading routes that we might call the Silk Roads, for instance, are going to allow for tea to travel. At this point, it's still a commodity, a luxury commodity, um, high in demand, um, and this kind of overland trade, long distance trade is gonna be possible because of changes in how the tea is processed, right? So you see the tea there, right? That's maybe not how we would expect to see it, right? We might expect, you know, dried leaves or a tea bag, but instead we have this brick where the tea has been compressed using molds, wooden molds, um, and it makes it much more portable. So this tea, it was traded in Central Asia, uh, in Tibet, in Mongolia, and further abroad. Um, in exchange, oftentimes, the Chinese were really excited about Central Asian horses, right? You can read a lot of sources about um, the Chinese going for these horses. Um, and another thing that we might notice is as we move tea into Central Asia is that um, the types of ceremonies or the types of processes for drinking the tea change. Right, so in Central Asia, if you get a cup of tea, um, here's one way that you might have traditional Mongolian tea, for instance. Um, you boil your tea for a really long time, and then you might add some kind of dairy, right? Milk or cream or butter 
Um, on top of that, maybe you add something like a grain, right? Millet or barley, something like that. And it's a, it's a saltier drink. That's my understanding anyhow. Um, so this tea horse trade was a big part of how, at first at least, um, during the Ming Dynasty, tea starts to move beyond China. You may be wondering, you know, how does it get to Europe? Because when we think of tea, what country do we think of? England, England, right? Um, so how does this happen? Uh, Asians have been drinking tea for centuries, but Europeans don't drink it until the 17th century, until the 1600s. Um, they're introduced to tea and coffee via the Islamic world at first, uh, but they're going to get their tea most directly from China. Um, the first shipments of tea are brought back by European traders from China. Um, actually, the first tea comes from Japan for, for Europeans. Dutch traders um, who had a close trading relationship with Japan brought back the first tea shipment um, in the 1620s. Um, then we have in France, tea in the 1630s. In England, 1657. And it takes off really quick in England. Um, just a few decades later, we have the East India Company um, not just trading for goods like spices in China, but they are now going specifically for tea. And by the 1750s, uh, there were tea houses all over London. There were tea gardens where you could go and drink tea. And people in England were importing um, nearly 5 million pounds of tea in 1750. Also, just to put a number on this, um, Great Britain's economy during this period was consisting of 5% tea, right? Tea was a huge part of their economy. Um, similar to what we saw elsewhere in the world, the, the way of drinking tea is, is going to be different, right? This is where we see the inclusion of milk as well, but we also see the inclusion of sugar to sweeten the drink, right? And this is where we see global connections really starting to form, right? Chinese tea and sugar from the Caribbean, right? Produced by enslaved people, right? So the English empire is starting to bring all these commodities together. Now, we said that Europeans went to China to get this tea, but how did that system work? Because there's a very specific system set up for Westerners in China to trade. And this system is called the Canton system because the city where this all happened is called Canton. It is a port today, a city that's called Guangzhou, um, but this is the, the name that Europeans used for it, Canton. And it's just a few miles upriver from Hong Kong. So if you know that general area of China's southeastern coast, that's what we're talking about here. And like we said, initially Europeans are coming to this port to get access to other kinds of Asian goods, um, spices in other ports, but here they were interested in silk and porcelain, uh, but now tea is what they are going after. They've developed a taste for it. Now, in the 1700s, the Chinese Empire was ruled by the Qing. Uh, this is a family, a ruling family of Manchus who were not ethnically Chinese, right? They're coming from the northeast of China and are ruling this country um, ruling this empire, excuse me, um, as the Chinese would. And they had a concern, right? Suddenly they have all these European vessels showing up on their coast. Um, the sailors are going uh, into port cities, they're causing a ruckus, and they say, ugh, these foreigners, we don't need any more trouble on our coast. Um, so ideally, we'd like to contain that but they still want to be able to trade. So they set up this restricted trade system in this port city of Canton, and it's very specific. Um, Canton's chosen because that's where a lot of the foreign trade was already happening, so obviously there's some benefit to that location. But in 1757, the Qing government uh, limits all foreign trade to that place, so it's now a legal question of what's happening. And until 1842, if you were a foreign merchant, uh, you would go to this port and go through the whole process of trading, uh, visiting with customs officials, and there were 13 specific firms that you could work with. You had to work with one of those firms. 
and those firms were licensed by the Qing government. Um, they're referred to as Hong merchants. As a collective, they're referred to as the Kohong. In addition to this, there are some uh, regulations that the British and you know, Americans and other foreign uh, merchants like to complain about. So for instance, uh, no firearms were allowed in Canton if you were a foreigner. It makes some sense, right? Um, no foreign women. Why do we think that? So they can't have any children and start to settle and have some roots uh, in China. Um, what was another, another issue with this, another regulation? Uh, they were restricted to traveling within just a few blocks in Canton, so they had very kind of limited movement within the city. And uh, finally, a big one is that when the trading season was over, it ran from October to March, they had to get out of the city. They couldn't stay anymore. Um, so foreign merchants, not too happy about this, but they're getting the tea that they want, right? They're in this tightly controlled system, but hey, it kind of works. People are profiting. Um, and they're making a lot of money, right? Uh, British are making a lot of money, French are making a lot of money, and those home merchants we mentioned are making a lot of money, including this guy right here. Uh, his name, his trading name is Ho Kwa. His, his full Chinese name is Wu Binjian. And he was famous for trading specifically with Americans in the 1820s, 30s, uh, and also with the British. Uh, and due to his cooperation with these groups and actually some investment in the United States, he invested in, in railroads and all kinds of things, um, he becomes probably the wealthiest person in the 1830s. Uh, he has a personal fortune of something like 26 million. Um, I, I tried to do one of those conversions where you figure out how much money that is today, and it was about $1 billion. So he had a lot of money. Yeah, that's a proper response, right? <laughs> he, he, he's had, he has it made, right? And I love being able to put all these slides on this big projector because I can see like how nicely dressed he is, mm -hmm. right? As Dr. Archer would say, he has drip. He yeah, he drips. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have people making money off of tea, right? Things are going well. Um, but there is a problem in the background, which I'll just allude to here, which is there are a lot of goods in demand in China, right? Europeans, later Americans, are going to want tea, porcelain, silk, especially tea. But how are they paying for this, right? What goods are they bringing that the Chinese would like? That's an issue that we're going to come back to. All right, um, to bring the United States into it, into it, the future United States, we can talk about how tea spreads to the colonies. Um, the British East India Company, this joint stock company, a company um, that is specifically taking tea from Asia and other goods and trading it uh, back to England, uh, it has a surplus. And so in the 1720s, uh, it is allowed to bring its surplus to the British American colonies. And so at first, affluent colonists are purchasing uh, tea, they are purchasing accoutrements to go along with it, and this starts to spread to uh, more people as more tea is brought into the colonies. And if you looked at a colonial home, you know, someone of middling status or someone uh, who's well off, you would notice they do have tea. They do have um, everything that goes along with it, right? The teapot, the tea kettle, the tea set, the tea cups. Sometimes these items are also coming from China itself. And if you look at um, portraits from the period, you'll notice, hey, there it is, right? They're showing off these tea implements. So obviously it's important to them. It's an important part of life. Um, and that material culture from Asia is in their homes. Um, we know where this is headed, right? Where does tea show up in colonial American history? It shows up in Boston, right? The Boston Tea Party. Um, so I won't go into too much depth here, but supposedly the British East India Company was supposed to have a monopoly on tea selling in the Americas, right, to the British colonies in the Americas, that is. Um, and so an example, late 1760s, the American colonies imported about 560, 100,000 pounds of tea from the East India Company, 560,000. 
but they can get tea from other people, right? They're smuggling in tea from the Dutch and the French as well. So they are smuggling in not quite twice as much, but a large amount, 900,000 per year versus that 560,000. So a lot more. So this is a problem. Um, 1767, the British Parliament passes the Townshend Acts, uh, which impose duties, taxes on various goods imported into the American colonies, which include, you guessed it, tea, right? Um, all the other duties eventually get repealed, but tea remains. Um, at this same point in time, the British East India Company is in trouble. They have this huge surplus of tea in London, uh, 10 million pounds of tea, holy cow. Uh, they also are in debt from conquering Bengal and in India, right? And so ideally, the British East India Company also wants to get rid of this tax so that people in the American colonies want to buy their tea. Instead, the British Parliament passes this Tea Act of 1773. It allows British East India companies to go directly to the American colonies and sell their tea. And then after the fact, they can go back to London and get a rebate on these tea duties. Um, how do American colonists feel about this? Are they happy that there is a tea duty? No, they're not. Um, they are going to protest quite heavily. Now, we're most familiar with the protesting in Boston, right? But there were protests in other locations where tea was being landed or was supposed to land as well, like um, Charleston, South Carolina, for instance. But it's in Boston where the tea ships arrive and there are huge protests. The Sons of Liberty, uh, this, this uh, group of patriots, uh, they disguise as Mohawk Iroquois, um, and they go to uh, the port, the harbor, and they go onto one of the three tea ships in the harbor, the Dartmouth, and they throw 10,000 pounds of tea overboard. Right? That, that's one-tenth of that surplus that the British East India Company had. And so obviously something else is going on with tea now, right? It's not just a beverage that people consume and like to drink, but now it's political, right? If you drink tea, that means you like Great Britain, you're a loyalist. Uh, if you refuse to drink tea, that's a sign that you refuse to cow to the British, right? So that's what's going on here in this image that we see, right? A political cartoon. Um, the geography is all weird here, guys. I don't know what to tell you. Over here is, you know, various people associated with Great Britain, including British East India Company um, officials. Down here we see the T on their side, right? There are some weird little markings that's supposed to be Chinese uh, characters. They are not. They're just <laughs> kind of gibberish. Um, then over here we have <coughs> Native Americans. Who are those supposed to be? Are they literal Native Americans in this story? No, those are the American colonists. And they're actually supposed to be the Sons of Liberty. And up here we have some you know, goddesses who are supporting their side. So rejecting tea meant rejecting Great Britain. People are stopping to stop drinking tea during this period in, in the colonies as a result. But following the revolution, they're all on board with drinking tea again. Um, tea drinking is back on the menu. And uh, by the end of the war, American merchants were really excited to go to China because under the Navigation Acts, they had not been allowed to directly trade with other ports, right? They're getting all their goods supposedly from the British East India Company or from British merchants. So 1784, we have the first American vessel that's going to go to China. It's called the Empress of China. And it carries a cargo of ginseng from the American interior uh, collected by Native Americans, gathered by Native Americans, and silver coins, right? Remember we had that problem of how do you pay for these goods? Um, the answer ultimately is going to be silver, but we'll come back to that. Um, so they make the six month long voyage to Canton. Um, we have a great source of this whole encounter, Council Samuel Shaw. Um, he's also a super cargo, meaning he's in charge of the cargo of the ship and selling it off for its various owners once they reach Canton. Um, he records this all in his journals 
And when the Americans first arrive in Canton in 1784, there's some confusion. What do they look like? They look like Englishmen, mm -hmm. right? And so these Chinese officials are saying, oh yeah, you're here with the British East India Company, right? Um, they don't literally say that, but that's the impression, right? Um, and so, no, they have to explain, there's actually this new country that's just been created. Here's a map, this is where we are, this is how big we are, um, much bigger than <laughs> Great Britain, so you should definitely trade with us. And then, you know, they were suitably impressed, these Chinese officials, and there, there are some other interesting comparisons made between the British and the Americans in, in this um, section, but things go well. And actually in just 20 years, America becomes the second largest uh, trading nation within Canton, right after the British, right? Uh, but always the British are going to be kind of far ahead in terms of trade volume. But the Chinese home merchants who were licensed to trade with foreigners actually liked Americans more. Yeah, so that's kind of nice to hear as an American, right? Why, why is that the case? Well, first of all, the American traders, they are all trading individually, right? You come in one ship and you negotiate your trading deal based on that one ship. What do the British do? They come in with their whole fleet of British East India Company ships, these huge monstrosities, uh, and demand to negotiate as a whole, right? So it's much harder to deal with the, with the British as a result. Um, we said that bringing goods to trade was an issue, right? So the main problem is that the Chinese have this huge empire. They have trading routes and networks already established. Is there anything they want that they can't get from those trading networks or from within their own borders? No. So Americans and British, they, they kind of go through this process of going on these long itinerant voyages before they reach Canton, collecting various things that they might sell to the Chinese that are, are in demand in those ports. So it's a weird little laundry list that I'm gonna read you all. Sea otter pelts from the Pacific Northwest. Um, seal skins from all over the Pacific. Sandalwood from Hawaii. Bird's nests. My, no, it's literal bird's nest, right? It's used in the traditional soup. Um, beetle nut. So my students from Asia and the Age of Imperialism will remember that discussion, right? It's this, um, this nut that, that you can chew and it's a stimulant. Um, kind of similar to chewing tobacco. Um, a whole bunch of other things, which I think we'll skip over. Also, Americans aren't just collecting goods as they go around um, the world, but they are also bringing a few things from home. Uh, pork, beef, obviously salted and preserved, uh, paint, canvas, bread, twine, spirits, turpentine, right? All these weird little products. They don't sell a whole bunch of this, but they can sell a little bit of it. In the end, they have to use silver, really, to pay for most of the tea that they are buying. Uh, Two thirds of what they're buying is with silver. All right, moving on. Um, so, like we said, you had to bring a whole bunch of goods and hope that you could not waste all of your silver trying to purchase your tea. But sometimes it was going to happen anyway. Um, now, once you got to Canton, you had to deal with a new problem. And that was, how do you buy tea, right? Uh, Tea has been grown in China for hundreds of years at this point and various varieties have developed, right? I'm sure you guys can tell me a bunch of different kinds of tea, right, off the top of your head. But there are maybe two main varieties at this point in history, green tea and black tea, right? And those both come from the same plant. Uh, it's just that you prepare the, the leaves differently. Um, in both cases, like we said, you pick off those top shoots you dry them, uh, then you uh, would roll them into a specific shape, right? So they're more compact so that they don't break up. Um, and then from there, they'll be dried. So that is, if we do that, green tea. If you want black tea, you do those same steps, but then you also leave them to oxidize for a while in kind of a slightly moist room, and then you fire them, right? You roast them a little bit. Um, so those are the basic kinds of processes involved. So if you're a tea trader, you have to know those differences, 
right? You have to know what that tastes like and what that smells like and what that looks like. Um, and so there's an expertise that these European and American merchants had to develop as they came into Canton. You also had to be familiar with your market, right? What kinds of teas do your consumers want? So pre-revolutionary colonies was super easy. They wanted cheap black tea. <laughs> but, but it was called buhi, actually, buhi tea. Um, but then as we have um, American consumers becoming more familiar with different types of teas, their taste chains, uh, sometimes there is a regional kind of preference, right? People in the West, they like their black tea. People in the Northeast, they like their green teas. Uh, so you had to become familiar with those as well. Another concern for these tea traders is, are they being hoodwinked, right? If they don't know their tea well enough, what could a, a disingenuous China tea trader do to them? They could sell them fake tea, right? <coughs> What's fake tea? That might be, you add dyes into it so it looks like it's a nicer colored tea than it really is. You add other plants that you like mix in with the tea so it looks like you have more volume than you actually have. What do you think that tastes like? Dyed fake tea awful, right? So initially American uh, consumers, they liked these cheap teas because they're cheap, but then they drink them and realized this is disgusting, right? <laughs> so they start to, to invest a little bit more money to, to drink higher quality tea. Um, and this is something that the merchants were fully aware of. Um, you know, for instance, I did some research on this at, oh, you'll, oh, sorry guys, you got the preview of the final slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so for instance, I did some research at the, uh, uh, excuse me, the Massachusetts Historical Society, and the merchants all knew that these were issues, for instance, so they're, they're concerned about the quality of tea and how you might distinguish that. Um, and some of the more experienced ones didn't blame it just on the Chinese merchants, um, so like Gideon Nye here does. Okay. So to get back to that issue, the, the whole issue with silver, you know, the problem for Western merchants is that they didn't want to lose their silver, right? Of course you don't want to lose your, your precious metals, right? You need that. Um, and it was kind of the economic logic at the time that if at all possible, you would hold on to that precious metal. You would hold on to the silver for your own stores. Um, but tea was in such high demand that people had to to spend their silver in order to buy the tea. So China was seen as this silver drain. It was seen as this problem that had to be solved. How do you get tea from China without losing all of your silver, right? And the answer is, you get them hooked on drugs, right? Uh, so opium. So what is this? The poppy, the poppy bird, the somniferum. Um, it's this plant here, the poppy, that can be processed into opium. Um, and it's a narcotic that by the 18th and 19th centuries is pretty widespread. Um, when opium is consumed, um, and when you're consuming it, it's that sap that's dripping here from the, the bulb, um, from the bud. Uh, you could either eat it, you could drink it, you could smoke it. Um, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream and acts as this powerful pain reliever. Uh, it slows the movement of your gut, so if you had kind of issues with diarrhea or dysentery, it would relieve that. Um, helps with coughs, Dr. Archer. <laughs> uh, but it also releases dopamine, right? So you feel super good when you take this stuff. I'm not saying to go <coughs> try opium, everybody. Um, it sounds nice so far, but it's not, right? Because there are ill effects as well, outweighing the benefits. <laughs> Um, opium makes you very lethargic. It gives you nausea, but worst of all, you get addicted, right? So this is the problem. Um, China had been exposed to opium as a medicine first in the 8th century, later as a recreational drug in the 11th century, but it wasn't until the 7th century, 17th century, excuse me, 1600s, when tobacco was mixed with opium that it really took off. Um, so what happens is, you know, early to mid 1600s, the Dutch introduce smoke, opium smoking into China and it starts to spread. The British, excuse me, are going to latch on to this and they start to grow and manufacture opium in their 
their colonies and their holdings in India. Um, and this happens uh, pretty much along this northern part of India, close to Afghanistan. And it was marketed at first throughout the British Empire under the East India Company. Um, for the British, this commodity, again, was a way to make money in China and to reduce the amount of silver they would have to spend. So it's really going to be indispensable for the British if we're thinking about this economically. Um, again, we know that tea is big, big business in Great Britain. Um, it's also giving revenue to India, right? It's paying for this colony in India, um, which is, at this point, actually losing money. It, it was highly expensive to, to conquer and to run. The problem is, is it great to get a whole nation, China, um, a whole empire hooked on drugs? No, not really. 1729, the emperor of China has had enough. He bans the sale of opium. There's, you know, repeats of, of this kind of um, opposition to opium, but the British do it anyway because they're making money. And there's this whole system set up where the British bring the opium um, on these really fast little ships to an island off the coast of China, and they have people working with them. Um, they're paying bribes to officials to get this drug into the country. I'm going to maybe burst your bubble a little bit. So far, we've had fun with the Americans, right? But they're involved in opium trading, too. They aren't getting it from India, though. They're getting it from Turkey. And the, the fun thing about this is that Turkey from opium was considered inferior. So they were bringing this inferior opium into the country and not getting as much money for it, but it did help them in this trade a little bit, right? Didn't fetch quite as high of a price. Again, Chinese officials are not too happy about this. Um, you know, by the early 19th century, millions of Chinese became addicted to opium. And during the 1830s, there was a pretty big debate among officials about what to do about this. Some were advocating for it to become legalized. Some were advocating for uh, a complete crackdown. And ultimately, that's what's going to be uh, the case. We have the emperor of China, uh, Emperor Dao Guan. He decides to take action. And in 1839, he sends this guy here. Um, Lin Shu, who has special powers imbued on him by the emperor. And he is supposed to crack down on this, this drug. Um, so he arrests 1,700 Chinese opium dealers. He confiscates 70,000 pipes. And he also has to deal with this problem of the foreign merchants, of course, who are supplying it. Um, at first, he just says, you need to give me all of your opium. What do you think the British do? Of course, they say, no, we're not going to give you our opium. Um, and so his response is to put them on lockdown in their warehouses in Canton. And this goes on for about a month and a half. And eventually, the new British trade superintendent, um, his name is... Uh, Charles Elliott, he's very concerned about all of this and he wants to resolve the issue, so he agrees to hand over the opium, right? If you were savvy about this, what would you do? Just hand over a little bit of the opium, right? Satisfy those um, officials like Lin Zixu. But Charles Elliott's kind of dumb. <laughs> and what he does is he knows that there's been cases in the past where the British government would reimburse merchants for losses. And he says, okay, we can do the same thing. Let's not cause any trouble. Let's hand over all the opium. So he scours, you know, the different warehouses. He talks to all the merchants and they hand over a whopping, I believe, six million pounds of opium, oh. right? What does Lynch the Shoe do with that opium? He does what he did with the pipes, right? He destroys it. He has 500 laborers, you know, cart out this opium to the Pearl River where Canton is located, and they first mix it with lime and mix it with salt. Is anyone going to be smoking that opium after that? No. Um, so they dump it into the river. Um, this is probably terrible for the environment, <laughs> Dr. Archer, <laughs> right? It ends up getting washed out to sea. Poor fishies, right? Um, meanwhile, Lin Zixu, you know, continues his 
I, we shouldn't call it a tirade, I think this is just. Um, he, he writes a letter to Queen, o, Queen Victoria, right, Queen of England, and he has some choice words to say. This is a very, very famous letter. You know, strangely enough, it didn't make it to Queen Victoria. It ends up being published in a newspaper instead in 1840. I don't know what that's about. Um, so he says, we find that your country is 60 or 70,000 li from China, so that's a unit of distance about half a kilometer. Uh, the purpose of your ships in coming to China is to realize a large profit. Since the profit is realized in China and is in fact uh, taken away from the Chinese people, how can foreigners return injury for the benefit they've received by sending this poison to harm their benefactors, right? So he's seriously concerned about this drug. Um, and he's pointing out the hypocrisy. Later in the second paragraph, he says, isn't this banned in your own country, right? It's illegal there too. So, Linz is concerned about all of this. Um, now, kind of to zip through things, this causes a war, the Opium Wars, right? Uh, in which the British Parliament is debating <coughs> whether what it should do about this situation. It doesn't actually have the money to pay back those merchants. So that's problem number one, which mm -hmm. is ultimately going to lead to war. But the British public really does not want to, to go to war over this. Uh, but it happens anyway. And the British absolutely trounce China uh, because of their, their navy, right? Their industrialized warfare that they have. One famous ship that's used in this war is the Nemesis. It's the first uh, iron steam, steamship, I believe, um, and sail-powered ship that is introduced in this, in this particular war. There are some more things I could say about that, but I think we have to skip ahead. The outcome is that Britain wins this war, and there is a new system put in place where it's not just one port open for foreign trade, but actually five initially. Um, Hong Kong's also ceded to China. And following this, you know, all kinds of foreign powers are going to start to put their, their, their claws into, um, into China. So Great Britain, France, Russia, uh, Germany, eventually Japan, all have certain parts of China, certain ports they are going to start to claim. So this is a period of semi-colonialism. But, you know, we're, we're, we're blaming all this perhaps on the British Navy, but there are issues going on internally within China as well that make this a very rough time and it explains why the Chinese aren't focused on fighting the British. Um, there was an issue with overpopulation since the Ming Dynasty. Um, the biggest issue though was that from 1794 to 1804, there was a rebellion in Northern China. It was a group of poor Buddhists who believed that they could help bring about essentially the end of the world and the coming of uh, a second Buddha, uh, the Maitreya Buddha, who would restore you know, everything to the state it should be. And the problem was that in the Qing government and in the Qing army, there were people who were not using the money given to them by the Qing court to fight this war. Instead, they were taking it, they said, oh yeah, we fought a battle, and they put it straight into their pockets, right? So after that, what happens to the funds that could go towards the military? Absolutely wiped out, right? And after that, was the military a popular um, target for giving money to? Not really, right? So this is one major issue that is weakening China. Um, and there were other rebellions beyond this. Um, if you want to, you can ask me about the Taiping Rebellion later on in Chinese history, where a guy takes exams and fails them and has a dream that he's the son of God and the younger brother, Jesus Christ, and you know starts a rebellion as you do. Uh, so happy to talk about that and its impact. So let's answer our last question, which is how does tea ultimately and its production leave the hands of the Chinese? Um, because the Chinese knew they had a good thing going, right? So were you allowed to smuggle or were you allowed to take tea plants out of China? No. Were you allowed to leave the country if you were a tea master, knew how tea was produced? No. Actually, there was a whole law that said, if you're a Chinese person, full stop, you can't leave the country during this period. Your 
your person belongs to the emperor, you, you are not allowed to leave. So there was a pretty tight control on tea and on Chinese people, but the British East India Company wanted to obviously start to produce tea itself, cut out the middlemen, and following the first opium war, they send this guy right here, he's a botanist named Robert Fortune, and he was you know, very well trained, the top of his field in Great Britain, and the British East India Company says, we will pay you lots of money to go to China for three years and to wander around and to bring back plants, especially tea plants. Now, one problem with getting tea plants um, away from a country during this period is, how do you get them across the ocean without them dying, right? And of course, when you're on a ship, do you have access to a lot of fresh water to keep your plants healthy? No. Um, there's a lot of salt water that might, you know, spray up onto your ship. That's another problem. And so it's in the early 1800s that we have this invention called the Wardian case. It's basically a terrarium. Did you guys have those when you were kids? And so you, you just have this kind of closed up box and it has a lot of glass on it. And you have a plant in there and it has a little bit of water. And if it gets some sunlight, it creates this process whereby it, it has water kind of cycling through it. And you don't, you don't need to put new water in it and it's preserved. And so that allowed Robert Fortune to take 40,000 tea plants to India for the British East India Company. And it's uh, the craziest thing about the story, guys, I'll tell you quick, is that Robert Fortune was undercover. He dressed up as a, uh, a Chinese official, which you may you know, find a little dubious, that's fine. Um, so he wore his hair in the Chinese fashion, the Manchu fashion of the day, which meant for men, you shaved the front half of your head and you had a long braid at the back of your head. So he had a fake one, obviously. He didn't have time to grow his hair out. Um, and he dressed in the Chinese imperial robes. And no one questioned him too much because they're just like, you know what, the Manchus are foreigners. Maybe this is what a Manchu looks like. Maybe this is what a Central Asian looks like. What do I know? I'm a peasant. Um, so he traveled around China. He ran into some pirates. He collected some plants and you know, that must have been a really fun three years. Okay, <laughs> so from there, the tea makes its way back to India. It gets tested out in different places. Um, and the best spot, it seems, is this region called the Sam. Um, and that's where the British East India Company successfully grows tea on plantations um, using Indian labor. And they are very successful at it. A big difference between the British and the Chinese is that the British are going to industrialize this process, right? So it's going to become more like uh, a factory production. And that will allow them to, if I can move to the next slide, um, that will allow them to surpass the Chinese pretty quickly, right? You can see around 1900 or so that Indian exports of tea meet up with where Chinese exports are and quickly move beyond that in the 20th century. And meanwhile, Chinese exports are going down. Um, and part of this whole process is that British companies are marketing their tea back in England and other places and saying Indian tea is better. Indian tea is healthier. Doesn't black tea taste better than Chinese green tea? All these kinds of things. So that's where we are left at. Um, I'm going to show you this map here really quick. Um, it's a little tough to see here, but those bluish cover colored areas are places of the world where the word for tea is, is basically tea. Uh, and that is because those are areas that got tea because of contact via maritime trade, right? Really interesting kind of fact there. Um, because in Southeastern China, there's this dialect, uh, Hokkien, and that's how they pronounce the character for tea. These places that are orange colored, right? The name for tea is more coming from the northern dialect of Chinese, Mandarin, and the pronunciation of the word for tea is cha, right? So that's why you get words like chai, and I'm not sure, was it in Russian? Yeah, so pretty similar too, right? Um, so what have we learned today? We've learned you know, where tea came from in China, um, how it became popular, uh, we learned also uh, how it spread via Buddhism, via 
Chinese influence within East Asia via overland routes and then uh, through these companies and individual traders coming directly to China to get this tea. Um, and today, of course, you know, tea is the second most drunk beverage in the world. Water is the only thing that people drink more. Um, so it's hugely important today. And there are very beautiful ways to enjoy this tea, you know, traditional ways to enjoy it, like the Japanese tea ceremony, um, or maybe Laoran Cha, old person tea. Um, or there are also newer versions of enjoying tea, like our favorite bubble tea, <laughs> right? Invented in 1986 in Taiwan, yeah. Uh, and, you know, there are also some older uh, ways of enjoying tea, you know, perhaps something a little closer to home, right? A nice tall glass of sweet tea, right? Okay, so thank you everyone. I appreciate your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you have.